Um, I'm Patty Riley. I am the director of the Global Communication and Media Program at USC. And this is our guest, but co-conspirator in this event, uh, Dr. Terhi Rantanen from the London School of Economics, who is the head um, in London. And we are here to welcome everyone and we're so glad that you could make it. We have quite an auspicious panel uh, today, and we are looking forward to uh, two days of wonderful intellectual stimulation, followed by a grand party. And that's always, you know, I think from the student and alumni perspective, the best part of this. But we, of course, are celebrating the 10-year anniversary of this joint program, which was the first dual degree program for both universities internationally. And even though I like to claim credit for it, I can't. The idea for this program was from a dear friend, uh, Tony Giddens who thought that you should have the experience of studying communication in the two great global capitals of media. And so, Terhi, I know you probably want to say something as well. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, I just would like to um, thank you and everybody at USC for inviting us here. It's, it's, it's quite moving actually and I can't believe that you know we have been doing this together for 12 years now and Patty and I think I, we sound like a married couple now we kind of <laughs> finish each other's sentences and, and all that so you know um, uh, all, all those friendships you know uh, we have been able to establish during those uh, these years and it's not only friendship between faculty members but between students as well and I, I think you know we affectionately call um, ourselves a, a globals, and I think this is, you know, what we are. So we are the globals. So here we are, the globals, celebrating uh, this um, um, anniversary, and I'm sure it will be an, an amazing event. So I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you so much for inviting us. You bet. Yeah. You thank bet. you. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Larry Gross, who is the Vice Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication and also the Director of the School of Communication. And uh, he's also um, part of another partnership that we have because we hired Larry away from our sister Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania. So there are all of these sorts of uh, partnerships and dual programs around the world. And Larry will introduce our esteemed panelists. A lot of shifting around here. Well, I'm going to take the opportunity as well to be the first to acknowledge and welcome Craig Calhoun, who is with us and represents another connection between USC and LSE as an alumnus of USC, uh, who, as I think you all know, is going to be joining LSE shortly, and uh, we'll be hearing from Craig later tonight. So it's a pleasure to introduce this panel that I should say probably needs no introduction, but nonetheless, we will proceed to introduce. Uh, Scott Waugh is Professor of History uh, and Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor at UCLA, where he was a longtime Dean of Social Sciences and Professor of History and Distinguished Teacher. Beth Garrett, a uh, Professor of Law, Political Science, Public Policy, and you don't list Annenberg, although we do have a courtesy appointment. I couldn't put it in my time. Oh, I follow all the we might have to work on that. <laughs> No, we would like to be. We'll have to talk to the to the to the provost. Uh, and Beth is also the co-director of the USC Caltech Center on. Not anymore. Not anymore. Well, it was. Long politics. Um, and one of my favorite things about Beth is she clerked for Thurgood Marshall, which I think no doubt left her with a you know, long-lasting impact on her. Uh, career, I assume and trust and have observed probably in, in some ways. Uh, Stuart Corbridge is, I think it's called Pro Director. That's right. Which is what we would call Provost. No, not quite. Not quite? <laughs> <laughs> I see. There are three of us. Oh. 
vice president at uh, the London School of Economics, where he's a professor of development studies and an expert on development, particularly in India. And the moderator of the panel will be my colleague, friend, and dean, Ernest Wilson, uh, who is also a professor of political science. We've got a lot of political science uh, up here. Um, uh, Ernie is also uh, a recent member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was, I believe, the longest serving member and at one point chair of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in the United States. And into his capable hands, I will hand this panel. Thank you, Larry. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a great panel. We've got great participants and a great subject matter, and it's, it's a great occasion. Uh, and I do want to add my uh, congratulations to everyone who's been involved with this program over the years. It's the 10th anniversary. It's, it's a wonderful celebration. It's a very important program. And rumor has it that it is one of the best programs at each of our respective schools. I hear it from objective sources who, who, who claim that. <laughs> but um, what, I'm, what I would like to do, I'm, I want to make sure that we have the chance for the panelists, the esteemed panelists, to interact with one another and also to interact with those of you in the audience. Um, and so I've got quite a script of about 142 questions, which I thought I would uh, set aside for the moment. And what I would like to do is invite each of our panelists to just make a brief opening statement on the broad question that uh, we're looking at today, which is, what does it mean to be a global university? And I have some follow-up questions that I would, uh, I'll pose to the panel, but I thought I would give them the opportunity to start by just addressing that broad question whichever way they would, they would like to. Do you want me to start? Yes, please. Well, thank you. Thanks. It's very nice to be here. Um, let me offer a couple of generic thoughts to get us going. Um, I guess everybody in the room will assume that the globalization of higher education is a good thing. Um, we would want people all across the world to have access to high quality higher education. I do think one of the things that we're going to be addressing though, which is much more problematic, which I'll come to, is what is the specific role of a so-called global university? I think my starting proposition will be that over the next 10, 20 or 50 years, uh, we will see the tremendous globalization of higher education continue. But the main driver of that will not be USC, UCLA, or LSE, the acronym universities, um, but rather will be the growth of universities in China, much more slowly in India, in Latin America, and uh, also in parts of, of Africa. I mean, I think we're clearly seeing at the moment the tremendous rise of first-rate universities in China. And one of LSE's partner institutions is Peking University. Uh, I'll save my powder on India, which is a particular interest for a question that's coming up later on. If you look at Chile at the moment right now, there's a redesign of their university system, very much powered, in fact, by an LSE academic, Nick Barr. So, you know, t to me, I think the globalization of higher education is not so much in our hands, it's going to come from countries that we're used to seeing as part of the, the global south. However, I mean, turning to our own universities, um, we're all global universities, we're all global research-led institutions, but we're also very different. So I think my second proposition is an obvious one, which is that the, the route to globalization, or what it means to be a global university in 2012, uh, will be quite different for our institutions. I mean, I was just asking Scott about the turnover of UCLA. It's, it's very different from the LSE. Let me, for those of you that don't know the LSE terribly well, tell you one or two things about it quickly. It's a university of 9,000 students, of which less than 30% come from the UK. So that's quite different, as I understand it, to any university in the US. I can't imagine a university in the US that would have less than 30% of students from the US. So we're a global university, first of all, in the sense that students come to London. We have 900 students from China. I'm looking at Mark Maloney, who might correct me, Director of Academic Partnerships. We have about a similar number from the US. We have about 500 from India. Notably, we lack students from sub-Saharan Africa. So we are a global university at the moment, first and foremost, by being a university located in London 
that recruits from all across the world. That's always been the case. Uh, there's some very interesting photos in our senior combination room of the classes of the 1920s. And you, you really see the sons and some daughters of empire there, particularly from South Asia and from, from Africa. It's always been an unusual school. Uh, but we're much smaller than uh, USC or UCLA. Um, we are the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, we don't do English, for example. We don't do foreign languages. We don't do laboratory-based sciences. But we have 22 academic departments running all the way from accountancy to statistics and social policy. But you know, the way that we're going to think about ourselves as a global institution, I think necessarily, given the history of the school, given the fact that it is, Craig will permit me, a sort of boutique university in a sense, is going to be very different from universities like uh, USC and UC. LA. We're going to have this conversation under Craig's leadership, and I'll, I'll hand on as I should do. Um, we have academic partnerships. USC is a good example of this. We want student mobility. We want faculty exchange. But we are not yet contemplating setting up branch campuses in the way that NYU has done. I and mean, I think that's something that we'll perhaps come to in later questions. So my sense of what it means to be a global university in 2012 is first of all a recognition that we're going to see many more global universities, I hope, around the world, and that the main drivers will come from the global south, and that the nature of a global university itself will be specific to the heritage and traditions of particular institutions. And I'll try and elaborate upon that later on. Thank you, Professor Corbridge. Provost. Sure. Um, I found this question a little bit interesting because it seems to me one can't be a university like UCLA, LSE, or USC and not to be a global university. So it, it, was a, it was a strange question to me because the kind of universities we are that are interested in the hardest questions that face people, in uh, those that are searching for truth, those that are working on research and creative work that will transform society necessarily have to be global because those activities are global and our students are going to be global dealing with questions that uh, affect us. So th there's part of me that just says to be a great research university in this century is to be a global university. Um, now like LSE, we have long been a global university at USC. Our first class of 53 students had two Japanese students. We have the largest number of international students of any research university in the country, of about 8,000 now. Our incoming freshman class uh, always has around uh, 13 to 15 percent of them uh, who are international. We have students from 115 countries, and in our incoming freshman class next year, we'll have 50 countries represented. So that's one way to think about uh, being global. As I thought about this, I thought that. Um, when we now at USC think about being global, I think we're driven perhaps by three principles, or at least three principles that struck me, and then I'll sort of play them out maybe in the uh, teaching field, although there's so much we talk about with research and service, which are also global. For us, there, have been, there are three principles. One is we will not establish brick and mortar branches outside of Los Angeles. That's a decision that we've made consciously. Others like NYU, uh, you mentioned Stuart, have made different decisions. But that is not the way we see uh, moving USC education into the world. The second is that we will only partner with the highest quality institutions in terms of teaching, research, and service. I think you are judged and should be judged by your partners, and that's why, in fact, we're so proud of this partnership. And the third, and again, this is unique, I think, to USC's organization, we will pursue globalization in a decentralized way. That is, the schools will be encouraged to seek out opportunities and strategic partnerships very aggressively. That goes back to the way we're organized. We are organized in revenue centers so that each of our schools is a revenue center led by a very strong and entrepreneurial dean. And the central administration then provides an infrastructure that allows us to share best practices. We try to reduce transaction costs where possible, gain efficiencies of scale. But we think we do better by like letting Annenberg figure out what makes sense for it, Rossier makes sense for it, the law school for it, and then think about ways at the central level that we can move things forward. So just to talk for a minute about how that might play out with respect to teaching, the way I see us being global, again, in the absence of the possibility of bricks and mortar branches, is first, of course, all those great international students who come here and interact with our students who are undergraduates and graduates in the international residential hall, in the classrooms, in the dining halls, in visions and voices, in all the events around campus. One learns how to be global and have a sensitivity to different cultures, different approaches, different ways of thinking by interacting with those great students and faculty members here on this campus. 
And of course, we also pursue very aggressively the sort of uh, typical study abroad programs that we've known about for so long. Some of our schools do that very aggressively. In the Marshall School of Business, about 80% of their undergraduates have some study abroad experience. My goal is that ha at least half of our undergraduates should have that, at least half of our undergraduates should have that by the end of the time. But I think the third way in which we've done it, and this is a little unusual, and I think of the LSC-USC uh, collaboration as being a good example of this, is doing these uh, dual programs. So that you, we have tended to do that in the graduate uh, realm, so that you attend LSC, you attend USC, and you graduate with degrees from both places. And we are using this as a model, actually. I use this as a model with my deans to think about other kinds of collaborations. Our School of Education, for example, is working right now with HK, UST, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, on a global executive EDD that will be in the same way collaborative. And I've talked to a couple of deans. We will also be announcing uh, in the next few weeks a new world bachelor in business where an undergraduate student will spend one year at USC, one year at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, one year at Bucconi in Milan, and then a fourth year at one of those three institutions and graduate with a bachelor's degree in business from all three institutions. Um, that'll be a very small cohort evenly distributed, we hope, across the three continents. But again, what we're trying to do is to bring global thinking into USC. I think we do better to send our students to Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, the London School of Economics, Bukoni, than to establish USC in Milan. Hmm. And so that's going to be, I think, the vision that we pursue as we think about globalization in the teaching realm. With that, I'll turn to Scott. I know there's lots more to say about research and service, and we'll do that during our discussion. Um, thank you. Uh, since you started off explaining what you're doing, I think what, it would be useful to start off by explaining, for me to start off by explaining the difference between public and private university and why we are much later into the globalization process than SC is. And we sort of look to SC as a model of what we should be doing and thinking about in terms of globalization or internationalization. It's not clear which is the right term. But in any case, uh, because our mission is public and because the mission is focused on California, <laughs> We have only laterally really paid attention to uh, our global connections and really trying to extend our reach globally. Now, a lot of that has happened quite naturally, uh, but the idea of developing programs, of taking in international students, and doing the kinds of things that SC has been doing for generations is something that we're just starting to think about in a very holistic and uh, really profound way. But I want to go back to what Beth was saying about the tripartite mission of the university and what it means in the modern world to be a global university. If you take research, for example, uh, research is increasingly collaborative and increasingly based on partnerships, and those partnerships are increasingly global or international. It's impossible to do big science now with, located in just one city or in one country or in one region. Uh, those kinds of networks expand across the globe, and you have to be able to rely on those networks and draw on those networks in order to carry out uh, big research and natural sciences. But the same is increasingly true in the social sciences and in the areas of, of uh, uh, business and law and economics. The impact of international connections is so important on research that it's quite naturally happening that researchers are seeking partners outside their borders and across the world. And not only that, but we're hiring faculty. All of us are hiring faculty and competing for faculty around the globe. And so we're developing, those kinds of networks are developing, in a sense, naturally. Uh, it is the case that we want to develop partnerships with excellent researchers in excellent universities, comparable universities around the globe. And that's what we set out to do with Peking University, with HKUST, the same kinds of universities around the globe where we can find those kinds of partnerships which are going to develop and enhance our research mission. So research is one thing that is increasingly global and it is in a sense happening, if you will, naturally or just in the course of the way in which professors interact with one another and graduate students around the globe. Then there's a uh, teaching mission. And here's where we've come to the table quite late, uh, as Beth explained. Uh, uh, SC is kind of the model of internationalizing its student's body and really being a, a, a location for international students. Uh, we're only starting to do that. We've done it for a long time in terms of graduate students, and graduate students have been international for a lot longer than undergraduates. But with the increasing flow of students around the world, I think every university is going to want to be to increase its international component. And if only for the reason to 
have our undergraduates have the experience of interacting with people from different parts of the globe. Because it, as uh, the question further down the line alludes, it, one of the challenges for all of our students, for all of us, is going to be able to navigate through many different cultures, many different languages, and be able to feel comfortable in a world that is very, very international and where you're going to be coming into contact with people from all over the globe. So education, teaching, is becoming global and it's becoming a very important part. That internationalization is becoming an important part of all universities, including public universities. Finally, there's a service component, which I think is also increasingly global. When you think of the problems that are involved in a city like Los Angeles, whether it's environment, whether it's health, whether it's obesity, whether it's uh, public policy, whatever the problems might be, they are problems which have a global reach. And when you want to engage in uh, service and when you want to engage in issues relating to your civic community, you by necessity have to think about the global context in which those occur. Uh, you just cannot think about problems on a local, on a purely local basis anymore because whatever happens locally is going to be connected to the rest of the world. And I think that that's especially true in Los Angeles. And I think the idea of being engaged in Los Angeles, civically engaged in Los Angeles, means a kind of global engagement. So we have a responsibility, I think, not only to our local communities, but through those local communities and through the kinds of problem, that problem solving that universities do, we're engaged in global communities and communities around the world. So I think that the tripartite mission of the universities uh, draws us naturally into kind of global connections. And those global connections, are, I think, are important for the development of the university, for uh, doing well by our faculty and by our students, and also by serving the uh, uh, populations that we serve. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me pose a question that maybe uh, brings together two, two themes. One that we've talked a little bit about on this panel, which is culture. One that we haven't uh, spoken so much yet about is, uh, is technology. And we see now these wonderful experiments taking place with MIT and Harvard, and Stanford and Michigan and so forth. Wonderful new platforms. And the image behind them is that this, uh, the technology will, in a sense, trump distance. But we've also talked about culture. And for those of us who have taught in Asia, we know that teaching a class in Asia is not the same thing as teaching a class in, uh, in Los Angeles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the question I'd like to ask the panelists is, um, how do you see that the interaction taking place between the potential of the technology and to universalize and globalize these experiences and the realities of the national cultures or, to that extent, the institutional cultures of these three great universities. So will one trump the other? How do you see the interaction taking place between those two? That's a, that's a, that's a very difficult question. Um, you know, it, it, I think it suggests um, a middle way between what we were talking about before, which is going to be very interesting. Um, yeah, I think clearly USC and LSE are both committed at the moment to being primarily based in terms of bricks and mortars, exclusively based in LA and in London, that we're not going to follow the NYU model of having franchises around the world. But you know, what you've raised, of course, is the possibility of a what my ex-boss Tony Giddens would have called a third way. Um, <laughs> and you know, this is not an area in which I'm expert, but it does occur to me that over the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to have to re-examine, possibly, uh, the business models of many universities. I mean, let me just riff here for a moment. I was lucky enough to have dinner recently with the, the vice uh, president, I believe he's called, of Wilson College, Cambridge, which is a guy called John Norton, who's written a lot about the internet and writes regularly for the, the Guardian newspaper in the UK. And he said, well, why are you so complacent in the university business? I mean, if you look at what's happened to book publishing, if you look at what's happened to the music industry, and you look at how much you're charging uh, young men and women to go away from home to live in dorms and pay a $50,000 ticket to get into the university in the first place, assuming that it's a, not a needs-blind admissions policy, what makes you think that is going to survive a potential tsunami of new technologies? I mean, for example, uh, we mix a lot with economists. What is to stop 100 leading economists transacting directly with students, or what you might call a consumer? Uh, our kids, we've got four kids between us, three of whom 
are at university at the moment or have just graduated, they're sensible enough to look online to see if there's a course on development economics being taught by some old guy at the LSE. There might be a better course being taught by somebody like Amartya Sen at Harvard. This is a generation that shops around. So I think that there are going to be some quite interesting issues here about what does a university mean? Why does it need to exist in the first place? It has to be something more than building social connections. Uh, clearly, the presumption is that there are very large numbers of people wanting to come to our institutions. The demand is secure. We have, uh, for every undergraduate place, 16 applications at the moment. 39% um, of all applications to the LSE this year are from China. 39%. That's up from 22%, I think, Mark, two years ago. <coughs> so the demand is there. Students like to be taught in small groups. They want the space for group-based work. But there might be technological possibilities down the road that it's difficult to foresee at the moment. Um, without betraying a confidence, uh, two days ago, I was talking to uh, an alum in Palo Alto. Uh, he's a venture capitalist. And he told me that there is a young guy at the moment being courted by the venture capitalist industry, intent on setting up the first Ivy League standard school in the States for 100 years, really since Rice. But it would look very different than the current business model that we all have. So I think that's the, you know, the downside risk that we can't easily explore at the moment. The upside, I think, is we can have lectures now at LSE, which we can transmit in real time to Mumbai. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is the, the third way. And you know, I suspect that in the next 10 years, the idea that there's a choice between being based in London and having branch plants elsewhere will look like a very old-fashioned choice. Okay. Well, I think uh, the way I think about technology differs whether I'm thinking about undergraduate education or graduate education. Um, I think there will always be a place for some group of institutions to offer a residential experience of education that simply will never be replicated by technology. What happens outside of the classroom, what happens in the residential experience. Now that may not be how everyone has higher education, but I think that's okay. One can have a market segment. And I think what you see here are going to be uh, institutions that will always have a robust residential component. But I see technology playing a really important role within that notion of a residential undergraduate experience. Um, for example, we have, I think it's very similar to what you just described, something called Ipodia in the Viterbi School of Engineering, where there is a class where 20 of our students are simultaneously in a class with 20 students in National Taiwan University, simultaneously in a class with Peking University, talking about global supply chain and global innovation. And then at the end, and I think this is really important going to your cultural issue, they all get together in real life and do a project somewhere so that they actually also have that very important interaction in real life, in person to person, having conversations, working on a project together. It may be one of the only classrooms where students from Taiwan and Beijing are sharing a classroom experience and technology has made that possible. The innovation lab has other components. We've made a very purposeful decision not to have entirely distance learning courses for undergraduates. We think that is not consistent with our way of delivering undergraduate education in a residential community, but technology can play a huge role of bringing, again, that international and global feeling in. But if you move to the graduate level, if you talk about professional masters, professional doctorates, and continuing education, that's actually where I think technology can play an enormous role in helping people get skills at a time in their life when they might find it hard to move to a location and to get skills that they can use to improve their own societies, to improve society as a whole. So we have been spending our time thinking about distance learning. I know that's not really the word you use any longer, but you know the kind of learning which is almost entirely online with some exam exceptions. For example, you might have to do an internship to get a master's of social work or do student teaching to get a master's of applied teaching. So they're truly hybrid programs, but a lot of the educational experience is done in synchronous uh, experiences, still small classrooms, but in distance. So our Rossier School of Education offers a Master's of Applied Teaching. It has 2,000 students 
getting a Master's of Applied Teaching, something we couldn't do here on campus, including from over 30 countries. Uh, and similarly, you see uh, our new program from our dental school in orofacial pain and oral medicine will be offered to practicing dentists around the world. The Davis School of Gerontology is using technology to train service professionals in a continuing education format how to deal with older people, because it's often the case that older women particularly may only interact with service professionals and they need to know how to deal with those older adults. So that to me is where technology has a real role to play, at least for us in the, in the global world. But I will tell you there are real uh, hurdles that you have to get over. Some countries don't recognize credentials earned online. For example, right now Taiwan and Brazil won't recognize that. There's the complexity. There are some cultural uh, issues, although I don't think we've found that as much. But there's language. Time zones are the hardest complexities, right? Somebody's asleep when somebody's awake. If we want to do Ipodia with Technion and Mumbai, that's going to be quite uh, an interesting class to try to do. For us, too, this is a very costly way of delivering education. We don't use online to deliver education cheaply. Uh, it's as expensive, if, if not sometimes more expensive, than what we do here, which means that we offer it at our tuition rates, which is, I think, going to be more of an issue in some of the developing countries and other countries in the world. So these are all issues we have to think about as we move into that realm in the professional masters, professional doctorates, and continuing education. But I think it's a way that technology can help global reach. Uh, Provost Wall. I agree with everything. I thought he was <laughs> Uh, when I was Dean of Social Sciences for many years, one of my responsibilities was overseeing ROTC, uh, which may seem to have nothing to do with this, but um, it was quite interesting. And we actually share programs between UCLA and SC, some of our ROTC programs. But I was struck one time uh, in going to San Diego for the Navy and learning about their uh, what would now be called distance learning programs. They had a very, very extensive uh, program of training uh, sailors in various kinds of engineering issues and mechanical issues. And uh, it was really quite successful. Uh, but a couple of things about that were kind of struck me and I think uh, underscore some of the things that Beth was saying. Uh, one is that, uh, <clears throat> that it was very difficult because it involved a lot of time zones. There was no cultural uh, problem uh, in, within the Navy, but there was a problem of communicating across vast different distances in time zones. Another thing was that the, it was successful because it was limited to things which were very easily done through video conferencing and were easily assessed. You could break down a problem into component parts and then reconstruct it and you could teach people how to make things or design things or repair things and you could test them on that because the, it was all very, very discreet, the elements of it. And if you look at what's happening in a lot of online education today, most of it, the big global enterprises that are now going on are based on enterprises which are largely in engineering or mathematics where there's an assessment uh, component built in and it's very easy to build the assessment into the kinds of programs and online teaching. That ain't so true for history, English, political science, economics, and other things. Uh, it is true for certain kinds of things. So, I, what struck me was that there, it's a very incredible tool, but it's also very limited. And we have to use it in kind of a limited way. Like SC, at UCLA is very interested in developing online products and in developing online technology and using it to maximize education at UCLA and outside UCLA, but only in restricted ways. We don't want to develop uh, Whole, whole programs based on online. We do want to use online courses to enhance the uh, experience of undergraduates at UCLA. We do want to use all kinds of technology to enhance undergraduate experience. And like uh, SC, what we want to do is to be able to start to develop uh, courses, specialized courses, where we can uh, have students in the classroom simultaneously. We've won programs with, between here and Australia. We've run programs between here and uh, Zurich and Tel Aviv, and it's a great experience. It's a great way of bringing people together from different cultures into a single classroom, albeit a virtual classroom. I should also hasten to add that like LSE and like uh, SE, we do not believe that building bricks and mortars institutions overseas, even if we could afford it, is a practical <laughs> or interesting way of developing. It's, yeah. it's like taking an old paradigm and just shifting it to a new place. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that residential universities are going to have a value and that that value will actually be enhanced if we continue to internationalize our student bodies. Because bringing people together and putting, having them live together, have the experience of uh, 
eating, sleeping, uh, taking <laughs> courses, whatever they do out there, I think is extraordinarily important. And uh, it's a, I think that, that for a long time, the residential element of universities is going to continue to be extremely important, along with the ability to assess and help people learn. Uh, and I think the jury's out on a lot of cases and what online education could do. And I think one of the things it has not done is, uh, to go back to the original question, has been able to uh, uh, bridge the divide between cultures satisfactorily, except in certain kinds of disciplines. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, just uh, go back to uh, Professor Corbridge a little bit, who talked, that, <coughs> who said that one of the main drivers will be universities developing in what we used to call the global yeah. south. Yeah. <coughs> and yet, um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that process, which seems to be perfectly um, uh, reasonable and, and likely to happen, might intersect with the technology piece that we've just been talking about. Uh, and and if, if that's going to happen, does that mean that we won't have the same opportunities um, with a, a Xinhua or a, a Fudan, where I know you also have, have programs? Does that present a special problem uh, with, with that particular dynamic of the third world? No, I mean, I, I, I don't think it does. I mean, I, I, clearly, I think that we will see the continuing rise of high-quality, higher education institutions in what perhaps is still called the Global South. Um, you know, I think it's going to come a lot later in India than has already been the case China. in China. <clears throat> the, the, the rise of the university in the Global South, I think, creates new opportunities for some of the things that we've been discussing. I mean, clearly, one of the problems that we face in the UK system is that the undergraduate education is for three years. Mm -hmm. So we have a particular problem in terms of the student mobility agenda. Um, we don't have the possibility of a junior year abroad. So it might be that technological links between universities of the type that you've been uh, discussing would be particularly advantageous in a system like the the UK system. At the moment, the cross-fertilization is happening mainly in London because it's such a diverse university already. So I think that that's, that's something that we can um, hope to embrace. Uh, I think also when we get the continuing rise of first-rate universities in different parts of the Global South, that will also create new opportunities for research collaborations of the type that Scott was mentioning earlier. So I, I don't see here any sort of tension between the rise of that system and problems facing the already established universities. Rather, I mean, it seems to me that there are, there are many opportunities there that we would uh, seek to exploit. I think later we're going to come to a question, I don't know if you want to run this on at the moment, uh, about the responsibilities that the uh, established universities, if you like, might have to some of these universities that will be rising in the global south. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll take that question separately. Well, I was just going to add, and maybe this is actually getting ahead of stuff, although he's not asking questions that were on the list, so I don't know why we have to manage ourselves. So it's a communication thing. We should just answer so. however we want to, which you have a I used to work to in politics, and that's what they taught me. Beth, so it's, like, it's, just, it's a communication uh, part. I'm waiting for a question that I was expecting. Yeah, no, we're yeah. getting those. So we're just giving the answers it, it, makes it, it makes it a lot better. So <laughs> I, all I would say is that it seems I welcome the growth of great universities all over the world. I mean, why would we do anything other than welcome the opportunity to have more educated people asking difficult right. questions and learning how to answer them in sophisticated ways. I think that is fantastic. I also think competition is a terrific thing. It'll stave us all, it'll get us all to, to work harder, try harder, go after better faculty, bring in better students. I think this is terrific. Uh, I do think though, as this happens, we can play a very positive role in the growth of these great universities. You know, we have long traditions in both of these countries of academic freedom, of uh, the kinds of values of gender and other kinds of equality that are absolutely necessary for any institution to be a great research university. Uh, to think about what it means to have promotion wholly based on the merit of one's ideas and not based on membership in political parties or on families or other kinds of social or economic considerations. So I think we can actually help think through some of these issues which can be very difficult depending on where it is in the world while doing it though in a sense, right, it would be horrible to come in and lecture people, yeah. but we could do, I think there are ways to partner, be sensitive, to think about training people here so they see those sorts of things. 
the last thing I would say is I was struck, I don't know if you all saw the um, Thomas Friedman New York Times op-ed yeah. recently where he talked about the U.S. provided $1.3 billion to Egypt for tanks and jets and $13.5 million for scholarships for American-style colleges in the Mideast that promote values of diversity and tolerance. And I think his point was that one part of that was money well spent. <laughs> uh, and I think I agree with that. And I think we could actually play a real role in that. It ends with us quoting a school teacher in Jordan that one kind of expenditure is for killing people, the other kind is for making people. And I think we could have a real role to play in that latter. Yeah, I thought that was one of the most eloquent statements on behalf of globalization yeah. and global education that I've seen in a long time. And uh, he really nailed that. Um, I, 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 again, I agree with everything that uh, everybody said. I, I would make two observations. One is I think that we can have a role in, um, uh, I think, developing uh, the ideal of the university in various places. I mean, the fact is that most, you know, most of these countries, especially uh, China, are picking up the American uh, ideal or the American concept of higher education and trying to build it. Uh, out of scratch, and they're doing a superb job of it. So our, we've already exported the idea, and they are really building on it quite uh, 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 noticeably. The other thing is I think that we have a, a, a role, a responsibility in developing capacity in areas where that capacity has not been developed. I think in places like, such as Southeast Asia, I think in Africa and in India, uh, we can have a role not just in uh, working with competitors, but also working to build the capacity locally so that they can get on the same kind of trajectory of developing a higher education which will uh, work to the benefit of all of their population and work to the benefit of those countries as a whole. And I think that that's something we can do and it's, it's part of the mission that we have and it's part of the service mission that we're responsible for. So I think that, that, that aside from simply looking, focusing on our main competitors who are out there uh, you know, trying to develop everything they can and competing with us, we should also think about, well, we've got a lot to offer everybody around the world in uh, various regions of the world, and we have to concentrate on those areas in ways that I don't think we really have adequately, and the Middle East is one of those areas, uh, and I think that, that that striking discrepancy between the kind of military aid to Egypt and the uh, 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 scholarships that were provided in uh, Lebanon and Jordan uh, or just uh, is a good example of that. The other part about competition that I would say is I think one of the weaknesses we have in the United States is we don't, one of the virtues and weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses that we have here is that we don't have a national higher education policy of any real substance or a coherence. And on the one hand, I think that's been really good because if you look across, one of the things I think is very notable about the United States is the incredible variety of institutions of higher learning that exist in the United States. And if you just look at Los Angeles, you can see just how diverse the opportunities for higher education really are and how it benefits the local population. Uh, and so I think that, that the fact that uh, our policy has been largely laissez-faire and decentralized has really been to the benefit of the growth of higher education in the United States. However, in the face of competition, it does present kinds of problems and it is the case that we are underfunding higher education. And I don't mean by that just the problems in California and the University of California, and I'm not dragging that into it. It's that all of us are suffering from a lack of investment in research infrastructure, a lack of investment in uh, educational infrastructure, a lack of investment in the technological infrastructure that goes on. And those are the areas in which uh, most spectacularly other countries are investing and competing and eating our lunch. Uh, all you have to do is go to uh, Peking University and look at the new labs that they've built, Zhejiang University, Fudan University, or KAUST in Saudi Arabia. Or it, just go to any of those universities and look at the kind of facilities that they're developing for their students and for their next generation of scholars and you think, whoops, uh, we're losing in that particular race. I, and I, again, I don't think it's just a question of public and private, public universities, it's something that's uh, a problem for public and private. So, Could I add one thing that, uh, that Scott reminded me of? He talked about, because uh, I absolutely agree with everything you said, particularly the last part. I think we're really going to miss the boat if the government doesn't continue to fund research. But one of the things I do think you were talking about, we could be a model of the ideal university. You talk about the model of the ideal university. And one thing that struck me as I look at some of the universities in developing countries is the failure to uh, incorporate in a meaningful way the arts and humanities in the study of technology, science, et cetera. I mean, many of them are very heavy on science, technology, natural and life sciences. And while those are enormously important, I think one of the real strengths of universities in both of our countries has been the awareness that a liberal arts education 
is what allows there to be creativity and imagination and the knowledge of how to use all of this great stuff that comes out of the labs in a way that benefits society and is morally and ethically responsible. So one of the things that I hope we can do is engage in a dialogue as these new universities come into play about how important arts and humanities are as well. And if you talk about underinvesting, that's an area where we're seeing serious underinvestment in the United States to our great detriment, in my view. Well, let, me, let me build on that, Beth, and um, uh, get back to, to something that uh, Stuart, you mentioned, which is, you know, it, the the discourse for the kinds of changes that we, we see in universities tends to be um, couched in terms of competitiveness. Yeah. And we've got to outcompete the Chinese, or we've got to outcompete this country or that country, which in some ways calls to mind the old Cold War uh, notion that the framework was we have to outcompete the Russians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and you've all talked, especially uh, Beth just now, about the importance of the liberal arts. How do we affect the public discourse so that we move it away from just a uti heavily utilitarian definition into something that recognizes the, the benefit of, of education and knowledge for its own sake, and not just a strictly utilitarian uh, benefit in, in, in terms of our global competitiveness? Yeah. I'm going to start with Scott, because he always gets that's a, we can just to, 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 right. To, <laughs> well, that means I have to think of something to say. <laughs> I'm confident. Um, well, I would I would simply pick up on what Beth said before. I mean, I think that that it is absolutely crucial for. Well, first of all, I think the ideal of education of developing well-rounded people uh, at the undergraduate level is extraordinarily important, and that I think that ideal that we have in the United States, and I think that this is an ideal that we've inherited from Britain and Europe, was the ideal of developing citizens, well-educated citizens who are going to play a role in their societies, not just on the basis of the applying knowledge that they gained in a vocational way in universities, but being able to use their minds for the betterment of society and to be able to engage in a liberal, democratic society in a meaningful way. And I think that still is the core of our teaching at the undergraduate level. Graduate uh, teaching is, of course, something very different. It is training in a field, and it is organized towards uh, <clears throat> enabling somebody to take their place within a very, very specific either profession or, or uh, academic enterprise. But I think that, that, that our, I think we should set examples, and I think we should set examples by uh, again, by when we reach out to universities, not just do it in a, uh, a way of taking advantage of the most uh, utilitarian ways we can, that is to say, research opportunities that arise that may have bring some kind of return or bring research opportunities that we don't have in our own institutions, but also in a way in which we further the development of programs which are aimed at uh, history, language, culture, society, uh, whatever it might be. And I think in that way also that, that it's very important that we, uh, that's part of being a global university. I think one of the things that we have a responsibility for is not just engaging globally, but also understanding globally. We have to develop programs of understanding what's happening in other cultures, just as we do of trying to understand what's happening in our own culture. And we have a responsibility for teaching and training in areas of uh, what used to be called area studies, now global studies, but all of the things that make up that are the components of those kinds of global studies, the study of local cultures, the study of local literature, the study of local art, culture, whatever it might be, and then helping our students and the students that we relate to overseas in other inter, uh, institutions understand how those things work together. So I think that it's the, to avoid the utilitarian trap, if you will, uh, it's important to make sure that our programs, that there, our outreach, our engagement, our collaboration is as broad as possible and is guided by the same principles that guide what we do here in our own institutions. Beth? Well, I, I guess I sort of reject what I think is a, a false dichotomy in your uh, question, which is there's either a utilitarian way of justifying something or there's the humanistic arts and, and values kind of way. I think you can make the justifications on both grounds and they're not mutually exclusive. I actually think that the humanities are important because it does make us better people. It brings us into touch with things that make us happier and allow us to lead more fulfilled lives. But it also happens that those same things make us better citizens, make the country work better. It also happens it makes you a better businesswoman if you're able to take what you've learned in uh, a humanities class 
and use that creatively and imaginatively to apply to a business problem or a law problem. So it, they don't have to be mutually exclusive, and I've always kind of rejected the notion that they are. Take Scott's very wise observation about global education is about learning about culture, empathy, how we, you know, the arts are one of the best ways to bring people from different cultures together to understand. Reading a novel might be the be one of the best ways to get a sense of that culture. So I guess, Ernie, I, I don't think, you know, when you talk about discourse, I think the discourse is robust enough and full enough to uh, contemplate and embrace both ways of justifying the kind of liberal arts, comprehensive, interdisciplinary education that I think has come from both of our cultures, from Europe and from the United States. I have to interject an example which absolutely yes. nails what Beth said. Uh, you'll recall the Enron crisis and uh, the problem with Enron and uh, you know, the, after it was kind of the dust settled, uh, it turned out that one, one accountant uh, got to the bottom of it and explored what really happened and what Enron was really doing. This was after hundreds of regulators and accountants and people trained in that area looked at it over and over again. And they asked this one woman, said, why? You know, you, you're an accountant. Why, why were you able to do it? What was it? And she said, well, it was very simple. I was a philosophy major. They taught me how to think. <laughs> I'm going to say I agree with my colleagues, but um, <laughs> that line thank you. Before, sorry. I'll, I'll give an answer around three words then. Uh, competition, responsibility, and courage. Um, and, and I'll pick up the question of the false polarity. I mean, competition is in part what keeps us honest, so I don't think that we should be particularly nervous about that. Unlike the states, we have really a quite a robust, quite an intrusive uh, national higher education policy. Uh, my colleagues that I'm looking at will live in dread of the word REF, <laughs> research excellence framework. Now, this happens every six years. We have to submit our four best publications for peer review. And that is one of the main determinants of the funding formulation, funding formula in British higher education. Now, this is something that was introduced in, in the 1990s. We're about to go through the fifth of these exercises. But first of all, it keeps post-tenure academics on their toes. So not just staff uh, coming up to tenure. And secondly, it has had the effect over time. I sound like an apologist for various governments at this point. It has had the effect of, over time of centralizing research funding in the research-intensive universities. And that, that has been to the benefit, I believe, of the, the research standing of UK PLC, if you like. Uh, the second element, of course, of competition that we're really grappling with right now, uh, as our colleagues at USC and UCLA, is just the explosion of competition all the way from undergraduates through PhD students into faculty. If you go to any British private school, which only in fact educates 8% of the British population, and some state schools, kids of 17 and 18 are making informed choices now about coming to the States or going to Italy or France. They don't just stay in the UK. And we're recruiting, of course, students from all over the world. That competition is going to be, I think, more and more forceful over time. PhDs, we are the first British university from 2013 that will fully fund PhD students. So their fees will be paid and they'll be given a stipend. Uh, that will put us on a par with the top US schools. That's a decision that has been consciously taken. It means reducing, in the short run, the number of PhD students that we, that we have. We hope to build that over time as we get scholarships. Uh, and in terms of the faculty, of course, I mean, you know, two of the big areas at the school uh, other than media and communications, are economics and finance. Uh, and there we're seeing tremendous competition, tremendous uh, salary pressures that we're having to deal with. But, you know, I don't think we should be scared of competition. It exists and it has many positive benefits. Uh, in terms of responsibility and culture, I mean, I accept the points uh, that have already been mentioned. It's particularly important, I think, to share ideas about the academic ideal, about citizenship, about gender practices, and so on and so forth. Um, I think our responsibilities have to be phrased differently in different parts of the world. But we've already partly mentioned the Middle East. We've partly mentioned China. In India, uh, Indians at the moment, uh, parents mainly, I suppose, spend $4 billion a year having their kids educated in the States, Australia, and the UK. That is not sustainable in the long run. There are five bills before the Indian Parliament right now on higher education. I think you know, a discreet lobbying there by the major uh, UK, US universities 
might be called for. This is a highly protectionist academic market. I mean, again, one doesn't want to lecture colleagues elsewhere in the world, but the way that we behave in respect of India, I think, would be very different than in respect of sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, there we're part of an initiative to try and rebuild particularly economics training, economics teaching with the University of Ghana. We're exploring this at the moment. And with a range of universities that previously were very strong, Dar es Salaam, Makareri, uh, not just the likes of Cairo and University of Cape Town, either end of the continent, that are actually doing very well. So I think the nature of responsibility varies from place to place. Uh, and the last one, courage. Um, I sound as though I'm with one of the kids at the moment, uh, one of our own kids. I think courses should be difficult in the long run. I think grade inflation is uh, detrimental to the reputation of top universities. I think students benefit from the seriousness of the education that they receive at the top universities. I think we have to be courageous there and not give in to populist forces. Uh, and they, they are all around us as students begin to grade courses put them on the web, and so on and so forth. I think we have to instill, as my colleague said, uh, the idea of integrity in a public service. I mean, this is something that's been very important to the mission of the LSE. We now have a course that is mandatory for every...